Hi, everyone. Happy 2020. Hi. Hello. Hello. So nice to see everybody. Mm -hmm. I know. I'm so excited to be here. We're excited to have you back, Michelle. Really, thank you very much for putting us into your schedule so you could embed well, when you asked. When you asked me if if I would be interested, I was like, what, they actually want me to come back? Oh, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you all. I had so much fun last time and we had Anne with us last time as well. So, so and she happens to be one of my favorite humans as well. So thank you all very much. What a great way to start out 2022. Yeah, I, agree. I agree. You have so much going on this year. It's very exciting. You have to I, that. you know, this year I'm like, okay, which is what I said I was going to do last year and the year before that. And I'm pretty positive that y'all probably share in the same, like, like the beginning of the year, you're like, okay, I'm going to do a better job of balancing this yeah. year, that life work balance. Let's see how it goes. And it's really hard when when we love what we're so blessed to do so much, isn't it? So it's like yeah. to say no, like crushes my heart. <laughs> so. No is a hard word, but yes. it's one that we all must learn. And very uh, true. Yeah. Can't say yes to everything, right? That is true. <laughs> but if we could clone ourselves, we could do everything we want. Oh, life awesome. would be so much better. <laughs> Great. Well, we, we are live on Facebook and we're also live in recording here. So um, I say we just dive in. I'm excited to have this first episode of 2022 with everyone. Um, I just like to give a little bit of housekeeping right off the bat, and then I'm going to just hand it right over. Um you'll see that this is webinar style. So you are, we don't, we don't see you. Those who are participating, don't worry if you're in your pajamas or whatever you might be in, that's completely fine. We're happy to have you here. If you do have a question, feel free to use that Q and A function and, and type it in there. We have a full program today. So I won't be interrupting Michelle with questions coming through, but at the end, if there's time, then um, we'll certainly take up any questions that come in. Um, if you just have a comment that you want to make and you're not looking for a response, feel free to use that chat function. But with that said, I'm going to hand it over to Kathleen if you could introduce right. again for today. Thank you, Beth, and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this session. Um, we were just discussing how this is our second year this month that we relaunched the RDH View. So yay! So thanks to all of our cast members for the time and energy and planning that you put into this and all of our wonderful guests that we have. So we're absolutely thrilled to have you back, Michelle. And so with that, I'm going to read your wonderful bio. Okay, so Michelle Hudson is the founder of Integrative Dental Coaching and also on faculty, speaks and consults as a hygiene specialty coach for Productive Dentist Academy. She's a proud and passionate fellow and new member of the executive board for the American Academy for Oral Systemic Health. She's a full-time clinical hygienist, leader in oral systemic connections and protocol implementation. She's a graduate of the Bale Donine Method uh, preceptorship, which is advanced training in heart attack, stroke, and diabetes prevention, and COIS trained in periodontal health. Michelle is a member of Carefree Cooperative and is privileged to be working on a Japan prevention project led by Dr. Kim Kush. She is a national speaker recognized for experiences in and out of the dental setting, sharing her knowledge, love, and passion for the mouth-body connection. And Michelle is a proud key opinion leader for Procter & Gamble, Creston Oral-B, Dent Supply Serona, and Carefree. So with that, thank you so much, Michelle, for taking the time to be here with us today. And I just wanted to start by asking you, what, what really brings you joy in your life, in your clinic, and with your patients? Oh my gosh, this we could spend an hour on, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, I First, I, I live my life in gratitude. And I think when you live your life in gratitude, it's very easy 
to find joy and live in joy. Uh, obviously, my family and my friends, my patients that feel like family and friends uh, are occupy the greatest um, space in my heart. Um, I feel like, you know, we're all born with the ability to change lives and, uh, you know, let's not waste a second doing that, uh, whether we're in the operatory or out of it. You know, when I'm with my gentle giant, my son is like six, five y'all. And he's so precious. I look at him and I see like this little toddler and, uh, um, he's this ginormous, uh, kind man. Um, but just being all in with the 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 humans that I'm with at that moment so awesome. lots of reasons to find joy lots of reasons for sure so I want to dive deep and um as you Michelle and I have a really good friendship and relationship and everything else that way but you know we've had many conversations and a lot of us dental hygienists do review health history do the basics with that but with what you do and what you coach offices with, you take the medical history to a different level and you focus on a few different things. Can you highlight some of those aspects of the health history that we should look further at? Oh my gosh. Okay, again, this is a topic that we could spend an entire day on. Um, uh, I'm not gonna take the basics of the health history, okay? We all already know how to do that. But what I think is really important when we change the way we practice, uh, we really get to um, just elevate that patient care and it empowers the dental team and it open up, opens up opportunity for collaboration. So the two things that we look at in our office are risk factors. And we look at risk factors with periodontal health, uh, caries disease, uh, function and physiologic, so airway. And how we do that is by following the P4 method. And so predicting our patient's risk for disease. And then, uh, and then once we've predicted that disease, then we can focus on treatment and, and prevention, maintaining the health there after treatment's been done. Uh, if that's needed. And then really important pieces is a participatory piece and personalizing it based on what each of our patients' risks are. And so with the health history, what we're looking at beyond what we're already used to looking at is let's really dive in deeper about medication. Like what medications are they taking? And you know, seven out of 10 Americans are taking at least one prescription medication. The top 10 most prescribed, uh, prescribed medications cause xerostomia. So what does that mean? We know before that patient, if it's a new patient, we know before that patient ever sits in our chair, if xerostomia is more than likely going to be a problem based on the medications mm -hmm. and the conditions that they have. And so we get to think beyond that. We also know that if a patient presents and whether they're a new patient, existing patient, and we want to make sure that we stay up to date on those health histories as well, not just do it in, um, when they're a new patient where it's thorough, but make sure that it's very thorough every single time we see them, because especially the last couple of years, you know, the average in America, the average American in the first year and a half since quarantine has gained two pounds per month. So you may have had a patient that had no metabolic conditions, whereas now they may have multiple metabolic conditions. And what does that mean for risk factors with in the oral? What does that have to do with us in the oral microbiome? Oh, everything, because we know that when our patients uh, cholesterol, so their lipids, high blood pressure, um, abdominal obesity, that visceral fat, um, A1C, all of these things. And I know that y'all can't do A1C testing in, uh, in Canada, but let me tell you what, what an, I have a lot of my clients here in the States that do not want to do A1C testing, and that's okay. The important part of that, especially given the AAP guidelines, that progression piece, the, the grading, we need to know what their A1C is because of 
the bi-directional relationship. And there's a bi-directional relationship with all of these metabolic conditions. And it only takes three out of the five metabolic conditions to cause metabolic syndrome. And, and by reducing, and so we know even before we've looked in their mouth, we have a pretty good idea how the health of their mouth is going to be, uh, whether they're a new patient or an existing patient. And, I think and airway, we're... let's not forget airway. Airway is very important too. And, and talking those oral systemic pieces. And so using things like creating uh, oral systemic, the bi-directional really, like questionnaires that you're doing with your patients that you can send home with them. I mean, knowledge is power. And, and I think we should utilize that. And we need, and it's a responsibility for each and every one of us. It's not a matter of, do I have time for this? It is, how do I create time for this? Mm -hmm. I think that that's the key thing is we have to create time. We have to put onus on it. And there's a lot of literature out there that talks about how some people actually, especially in the U.S., there's a U.S. article, and it talks about how they actually saw the dentist more than they saw their primary care physician yes. for COVID. And so that puts a bit more of onus on us to make sure that you can't just say any changes with your health history, because what does that mean to somebody? Maybe they filled out the form five years ago. You really have to go back, okay. and you've got to update that stuff. You've got to go through and medication, dosages, the reasons they're taking it, and then relate it back to what you find. Exactly. It's about looking for these risk factors and the dry mouth and the link to caries and, and everything else and finding the why behind our do. So then patients understand and, mm -hmm. and have the reasons that they really do need to come see us, even though COVID is a huge thing. And depending on where you're watching us from different scenarios, but we do need to make sure that they're coming in for appointments so we can keep them healthy. And one thing that I would like to point out is have you had any medication changes? They haven't seen you in two, three, six, or some of your patients haven't seen you since pre-COVID. Yeah. And so I really like to say, will you just remind me, let's run through all the medications that you are currently taking, uh, taking, and then we'll, and then compare to what they were taking the last time that they were in your practice. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I apologize if there's more that you want to talk about as far as your medical histories. Please continue on that. But on that same trajectory, I'm curious with your coaching, um, how you approach the assessments and sort of what you are, how you coach them as far as that aspect of treatment. So, you know, with coaching, you have a lot of time. You have, you know, I'm there two days with them and then I'm with them a minimum of six months. And so it's not like we're trying to pack it all into like a one or two hour. And so we're able to dive really deep in there. You know, everyone you hear us speak, all of us are oral systemic educators. And you're like, oh, I want to take that back and do it today. So I speak to a lot of really great protocols. And uh, but the most important thing to do is is have a conversation, uh, really be very thorough and understand that health history, the bi-directional relationship given their systemic health and, and their, their, we know the oral microbiome. Well, if they have periodontal disease, what does that mean for their health? And so I'm a real big believer in, in salivary diagnostics. I wanna know periopathogens and I also like to know candida and strep mutans. So that's one piece to it. Uh, the head and neck exam and including the, um, you know, the physiologic, the questionnaires with the physiologic. So with coaching, we just break down and I have cheat sheets. I have a patient education book that is really, I initially wanted to create this patient education book for our patients. But as I started going out and coaching and speaking, I started realizing I just assumed that everyone practiced the way that we did in our office. And I've been in uh, uh, an, <laughs> an oral systemic uh, protocol, like risk factor, we're a risk factor practice. And I've been there almost 14 years. So when Bruce, Dr. Bruce Baird said, Michelle, I want you to go out and share with the world your passion for dental hygiene. Everyone needs to hear it. I thought, oh my gosh, I mean, I don't really think I'm doing anything different. I'm loving the heck out of my patients. And I believe every single one of us are doing that. But the magic and what went on under the roof of my office that I've been so blessed to be a part of 
is the risk factors. And, and so what I, I changed about the book and I did it with uh, Nikki Mackey, who's incredibly creative. So I just give her all this information and she made it work is we created uh, like the oral systemic pieces. So allowing, and remember to make it participatory. And so that's really very important. Your patient has to be a part of it. We were taught in college to tell our patients what their disease state is and what they need to do to fix and what we're going to do to fix that, right? But about 20% of the time, our patients listen. So they come back, well, more than that will accept, I believe, but then they come back for those recall visits and you're like, what? You have inflammation everywhere. We have active disease. Why is there no change? It's because we're not allowing them to participate in every step of the way. So there is actual scientific proof that by having our patients participate in their own health, that you're actually going to get 50% to 90% better and uh, um, your patients are going to be healthier because they're a part of it. So Carrie, I tell you, you have periodontal disease. We talk your risk factors. We talk oral systemic. I have you fill out this form. We're going through a Carrie's risk assessment, which is so important. How many of your patients, if there's any doctors on here, but hygienists, we get it more than even the doctors do, I think. What, I was here six months ago. I was here 12 months ago. Why, I didn't have a cavity then. Why are you telling me I need a crown now? Or why are you telling me, you know, that I was here three years ago, what's changed? Well, they're taking five medications since the last time they were in. They have rampant decay, but they have xerostomia and they haven't been in in five years. If you do these risk factor sheets with your patients, that carries risk assessment. I use carry freeze risk assessment. It is simple and it is easy to talk through that with your patients. Your patients fill out part of it. The doctor, the team is filling out the other part of it. Your patient does not question what their risk is. And you're doing that on a yearly basis unless something in their health has changed. That's good. So, well, how Michelle, like, can you tell us, like, how how long does this assessment take, and how do you formulate from that your dental hygiene diagnosis? And can you do this all in an hour, right? Uh, no, I mean, not. <laughs> so here's the thing: not initially, not initially. Our comp exams for our new patients or a patient that hasn't been in in two years, they fall back into that comp exam because we have not seen them in two years. Do y'all think that's fair? I think that's very fair because too many things have changed, especially in the last couple of years. I think y'all will agree with that. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I had patients, perio patients that I've had maintained for years and they come back in, it makes me wanna cry. They come back in uh, after, after quarantine and, and for the first time in years, they're showing signs of disease again. We have to take into account everything that's going on systemically and what is the number one driver of inflammation in our body? It's stress. And there is not a dang person on this planet that has not been affected in what's been going on the last couple of years. And so we do have to be extremely compassionate with everyone, even that the stinkers who don't get it, right? We have to be compassionate, but we also have to do what's right. And so a thorough exam in our office is two hours. And they actually will, patients actually go in with our doctors initially for an hour. And those risk factors are, they, they walk through risk factors, uh, the carries uh, um, risk assessment. And then based on their risk factors, and I know some of you hygienists out there are like, oh, I do not want my new patient going in with my doctor first because he's not even going to look at perio until they come in my office. It is a, it is, it's a change. It's a mind shift. And I'll tell you, half the practices I coach are not interested in doing it that way. But we do work with that hour and a half to two hour visit to establish what our patients' risk factors are and the best plan for them. And then based on that, I will, if it is a periotherapy patient, depending on what stage and grade they are, 
I will see that patient. And there are people who do this differently, but we like salivary diagnostics that hemoglobin A1C in, in my office is done. But again, if you have in your country, you don't have to do that. But you know what that opens up? You have a patient with periodontal disease, you're going to start periotherapy or, or it's going to be a continuation of periotherapy. You need to know what your patient's hemoglobin A1C is. So what did that just do? That just opened up collaboration with physicians. So what does that do for dentistry? What does that do for healthcare? And what does that do for our patients? We had a, a patient that came to our practice not that long ago. She came in through the hygiene department and one of my colleagues said to her, um, you're uncontrolled. You've got diabetes. What is your numbers? And she's like, what? I've been seeing a hygienist forever. I'm a type one diabetic that is not stable at all. She is all over the place. And she said, I'm not seeing you. We need to get some information from your doctor. We need to get your perio under control, but this is an issue. And she went home and she left the office really upset like really upset. And then her mom and her decided to, you know, refer to Dr. Google and Dr. Google told them that this <laughs> hygienist was right. And she was like, okay, dang it. I can't believe that it took me this long. And I'm like 26 years old. And my mom feels bad that she was never told that this could have been an issue and, and could have been, you know, leading to some of this. I'm ready to take this on. Tell me whatever it needs. We're going to figure out how to finance it because I understand. And so I've had that conversation and sometimes the patients are like, you want to know my what, my what, why, why are people now all of a sudden asking this? And so it's about getting comfortable in some of these uncomfortable conversations and people like Michelle can reach out and you can, she'll help you understand how to incorporate this or how to have these discussions. But this is really how we start to bridge the gap and to, yes. and to inspire people to say, Hey, we're not just teeth cleaners. We are really evaluating oh. so many things. Can we all agree? Can we like start this like movement that it is not a damn cleaning? It is not like my skin crawls and even a couple people in my office, I still hear them say that every now and then with the patient. And I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that. Like, I think they say that because they know it drives me bonkers. We are preventative specialists. And what we do is lower the bacterial load within their oral microbiome, which lowers the bacterial load within their entire body. It lowers inflammation with that in their entire body. I'll tell you what, we're some freaking, you know, superstars, what we are. I agree. You know, it's just like the bell doning, you know, I will, it was one of the most amazing. And I'll tell you what, talk about, um, I've always, I've never questioned my purpose and dental hygiene being a big part of my purpose and it's my avenue to love my patients right to love people well but I knew that what we do is important but when I went to the Brad and uh, Brad and Amy's preceptorship and Amy's going over um you know oral health and you know there's 200 people in the room you know mostly doctors, physicians, dentists, and then you have nutritionists, nurse practitioners, et cetera. There were 12 hygienists in the room that day. And she had every one of uh, we hygienists stand up. And she said, I want everyone to give these hygienists a round of applause. They are saving lives all day, every day. This is the most underappreciated profession. And I'll tell you what I'm going to say, and this might tick a bunch of you off. But part of that underappreciation is because we call it a cleaning, because we're not talking these oral systemic connections. And if you don't get it, guess what? Today is an opportunity that will change your life forever. Get excited about it. Be proud of what we are so blessed to do for a living. And the opportunity to improve our patient's health, man, we have opportunities that most healthcare providers do not have. No. And Michelle, just to add to that with the reducing the bacterial load, how do you set your patients up for success um, for home? To oh, oh. Like what do you, what do you recommend? Okay. This area, I think that y'all will agree. Uh, maybe you won't. It's okay. If you don't, I feel like this is probably the most neglected area of education. Uh, we, we educate our patients in about two minutes on home care. And what do we do? We recommend, you know, there's this really, you know, you know, Betty, you have periodontal disease. And if, you know, 
to really help take care of you at home, it would really be beneficial if you use an electric toothbrush. I would recommend the Oral-B I-O. I know it's expensive, but it's a really great toothbrush. Oh my gosh, shame on you, Betty. Don't do it that way because guess what? You've just given that patient an option. Do you know how we set them up for success? Remember how I said the participatory piece is key in the health of our patients and the success of our patients? Um, part of participatory is a prescription-minded home care regimen. Yes. It's not an option. This is what we're going to do to treat your periodontal disease, to treat your caries disease in our practice. But your part, see, we're going to, we're a team here. My doctor, uh, myself, and you, we're a team. And together, we're going to work together to get you healthy. Now, your part of this is even more important because you're not going to see me again for two, three, or six months. So making sure that we can continuously reduce that bacterial load Make sure that we're reducing that inflammatory load within your oral microbiome, which is going to benefit your entire body. What I'm going to do is we're going to send you home with an oral BIO because we know that this toothbrush brush is 50% better than a manual toothbrush. And there was a great study on that proving that, but I don't think any of us would argue to that. And then second, we're going to... You know how often I recommend flossing? This is going to blow some. You're falling out of your chairs right now. So there were, uh, there was, a, I was, I was at an event and they were talking and they asked how many hygienists floss their teeth. Y'all wouldn't believe it, but it was less than 40%. How many dentists floss their teeth? Y'all are going to believe this. It's less than 30%. We take care of them. We know. But it's not that they're not cleaning interproximal. They're using water flossers, soft picks, interdental picks and brushes. They're using these other adjunctive tools. And when it comes to our patients with crown and bridge work, and there's even researchers, even a, 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 and if you want it, let me know and I'll send it to you on the water flosser, where it actually shows with our perio patients that have four uh, or greater pockets that the water flosser actually does a better job at cleaning those those surfaces, because we know that floss can't do that. We know that it can't penetrate that deep. And so we're giving them tools that we know they're more likely to use because they're easy and, and, and we're not giving them an option. This is their part. And guess what? You think, oh, I'm not going to make my patient. It's about the money. Do you know why money's a problem? Because we make it a problem. There was a study that was done, and I believe it was by or a pharma, and I could be wrong, but they asked uh, patients, and I think it was something like 1,500 patients or something like that, five questions. One of the questions is why they didn't accept treatment. And uh, one of the questions or one of the answers was money. So number one being the most is patients didn't understand there, they didn't understand the treatment plan. They didn't understand their disease state. The least was money. We instill value in our patients. And so they listen to us. If we believe in these home care tools and these products, guess what? Nine out of 10 times, your patients are going to follow that. And because they want to be healthy, especially now more than ever, people want to be healthy. And we know that every time we turn around, there is a new peer review talking about the oral systemic links. And our patients are seeing that. Mm -hmm. It does matter. So setting them up for success is tell them what they're going to do to take care of themselves at home. Don't give them an option to do it. Now, of course, they do have an option, but we're not going to tell them that. <laughs> Michelle, I just love your energy. I wish I could call you before any hard thing I do, just to like yeah. get myself <laughs> and motivated. We did a little dose of daily Michelle. <laughs> Honestly, I've, I've written down a quote, and this is just so perfect. I think you would, it was earlier on, but you said, I don't know if I'm doing anything different. I'm just loving the heck out of my patients. And I think <laughs> I'm going like, to write that somewhere because it's just so perfect. 
Michelle uh, Hudson. That's what we do. Michelle Hudson, I will, I will put your name on there. <laughs> I think we all, you know, we were talking about this earlier. I think that hygienists are golden at nurturing our patients. I think that, I think humans, especially women, and I'm sorry, I know that we're not supposed to do that these days, but we really, it's like we we feel like we're being um, we're fulfilling our purpose when we're nurturing the people that we love, mm -hmm. and it's why we're so successful uh, at dental hygiene because we in really nurturing is loving, and we all want to be a part of something bigger than what we are, and uh, and I believe that hygienists are golden. We never expect to be like the like we don't need attention we don't need that we don't we we really just want to do our part in the practice for those of us that are in and out of clinical we really are just excited to be a part of something that's going to help our country our world our world be healthier and the best way to do that is by loving people well i love that and just as i was talking about your superhuman ability to motivate um there's one <laughs> thank you for that by the way that was really sweet i mean it i mean it um but there's one aspect i'm hoping you can help me with when we are talking to a lot of our um you know our members at rdhu one thing that causes just so much frustration is probing like getting those numbers getting accurate readings carving out the time um do you have anything because it's just so important that i don't want to I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk to you about it when you're coaching like what is how do you approach that whole subject how do you ensure that that it's being done so um as i first began as i entered the world of coaching uh, my heart was quickly crushed because i learned that it is quite rare that a probe chart is done accurately and it is a none of us would be licensed if we did not know how to do an accurate probe chart. My heart goes out to hygienists because you feel like there isn't enough time. And uh, you know why I have found, there's a, another study, I speak to studies a lot. And I actually learned this from Katrina Sanders and I snagged it from her. The biggest issue is, is that we are not that we are not co diagnosing and diagnosing disease. So in this study, it is perio codes, they looked at insurance companies and throughout the entire country. And they looked at the perio code versus all perio codes, profi code versus perio codes. So ages 18 to 34, guess what the average, guess what the perio code percentage was? Hmm. 27.5%. So do you think in the next two groups, so they went up a group and then the next, the, the, they did, um, 50 to 64, that was the third group they looked at. And I really wish they would have done 65 and older because as we all know, 65 and older, we have 70% of the population that has periodontal disease. But let's look at uh, 50 to 64. Do you think that the perio codes were used more or less? They should have been used be more. 4.6%. That's it. So as our patients, not only as our patients' risk for oral disease increases, but our patients' risk for systemic disease as well, diabetes, all of those metabolic conditions, the number one cause of death, you know, heart attack, stroke, cardiovascular disease is a nightmare. It keeps going up. Diabetes is going up. So as these risk factors increase, we're diagnosing periodontal disease less often, yet we wonder why we don't have time to do a probe chart. So that term, I'm doing a bloody profi, fits right in there. If you're scaling 
in ultrasonicing your patient for more than 20 minutes, you have a misdiagnosed patient. If you are diagnosing your patient properly, it is only 20 minutes that you need to even be scaling and ultrasonicing your patient. Mm -hmm. So you have, and I, and I know it's different in Canada. And so you girls can take over that section. I know Carrie, you work in um, the States a lot, so you can probably answer this even better than me for Canada. Um, but when you have adequate time to care for your patients, you have, there's that 20, 20, 20 rule. You have time to do a quality care visit, but it comes down to more than anything, conversation and co-diagnosing, diagnosing. And when we start doing that, not only are we going to open, like our stress level is going to go down, the respect that we get, not only within dentistry, but all of healthcare and within our patients is going to improve our stress level. Like we are going, there's going to be so much more joy. And again, our responsibility is to tell our patients what their disease state is. Our patient's responsibility is to accept that. You do not treat that patient for anything other than what their disease state is. That's important too. I will not see it. I feel like in Canada and, and with some of the work I've done in the U.S., we're so worried that people are not going to like us if we tell them sometimes the truth. And so, you know, by telling them that they have stage three, grade C, parodontitis, it's like, well, what are they going to do? Are, am I going to have to be truthful? So I might write it, but I don't communicate it. And I think how many of us are practicing, and I'm really excited with some of the comments, you know, we've got some really great uh, hygienists and doctors on, on the, the, the call today. When you practice this way, your patients love you more, because that's the one thing I hear people say to me all the time, Carrie, I can't believe I'm 50 years old and someone finally demonstrated how I need to use that electric brush. I bought it. Yes but I didn't get the results because I didn't use it properly. You showed me, you physically showed me how to do it. You took the time, you talked about bleeding and you didn't just say, I have a lot. You said, Carrie, you have a hundred bleeding points out of 186. That meant something to me. So these assessment tools are not meant to drive us crazy and to make mm -hmm. us more stressed out. We can use them as leverage to educate our patients, for them to understand that it's not just a cleaning, we're doing this as a risk assessment. And you touched on it with grading. Grading is a risk assessment. They either are low, moderate, or rapid risk. So why don't we use that conversation? And we have to make sure that periodontal charting is done routinely and regularly. Yes. And again, in the US and Canada, it's a little different, but we have to make sure it's done a minimum of every year. We just have to have that. That's what we need to do to have these conversations. So. Soapbox finished, because I know we can talk about this one forever in a day, I know. Um, but one other thing I want you to touch on quickly uh, before we move on is airway. I know airway and assessment, you kind of briefly discussed that. Could you give us a quick little synopsis of, of your assessment with airway? Okay, head and neck exams. How many of you are doing your head and neck exams? I know here in my country that only 15% of dental practices are routinely doing head and neck exams. That's another one of those responsibilities, just like the probe chart, that we would not be licensed today if we did not know how to do that. Uh, there's a reason that we learned how to do that. And I can tell you, I have patients that I have a patient that I didn't see. And I have to say this because it leads, and then I'll go to airway, but that head and neck exam Again, that 2020-20, when we're diagnosing properly, we have time to do all the things. But I have a patient that I didn't see for a year. We had done a scan and a head and neck exam and her, her checkup x-rays uh, the October before quarantine. She was scared to come in. She had a, a sinus infection. Um, uh, she wouldn't come in. I finally, you know, I, I kept talking to her, trying to get her in. I've been seeing her forever. She's an incredible human being. She comes in and because of that head and neck exam, we found, uh, stage, we found her cancer in stage one and she still lost part of her mandible, but we found it in stage one. So I will celebrate that. Um, airway, I can tell you that something that is rarely ever discussed is the role that airway plays in, in periodontal disease. 
do you have these patients that have periodontal uh, have periodontal disease and you cannot you're struggling getting them uh, healthy if we're looking at you know there's question errors the f worth is part of our health history uh, there's the stop bang as well. But then while you're doing your head and neck exam, do the malampati score and uh, the tonsil grades and then look at those questionnaires. And you will find that lack of sleep is the second most influential factor in the progression of periodontal disease. And many people do not know that. We're not diagnosing uh, obstructive sleep apnea in our sleep disordered breathing, but we absolutely can treat it. And uh, obstructive sleep apnea is a big bad daddy. And, um, and we, that's just, what, just like diabetes and, you know, all these metabolic conditions, cancer, uh, by addressing that. And then, and then talking nutrition, which I know that we we'll probably not get to that today, but uh, you really, I cannot tell you how many patients because we took the time to do a sleep assessment are now in sleep appliances and CPAPs and their lives are changed forever, forever. Well, Anne Rice says it well. She says, you know, you may not do root canals, but you screen for them. And so we have to do the same with sleep. We don't have to treat it in our practice. We have to have that conversation and have that collaborative where we can kind of refer out. And this is where this whole oral systemic component, the metabolic, like we don't realize that lack of sleep, how much that impacts so many functions and so many parts of the body. Um, and sometimes that's one of the risk factors for many things. So, you know, we should be asking in our health history about sleep. We should be kind of discussing that with people and, you know, we can go on forever on it. I know, but it's mm -hmm. so, so important. Yes. And if you do not want to be a sleep practice, that's okay. I have teams that do not want to be a sleep practice, but we have taught them how to assess and, um, and it's very important. So I do want to touch a bit on nutritional counseling because it really does play in with metabolic disease. It plays in with periodontal disease. It plays in with so many things. And particularly with all that the whole country, the world is going through in the last two years, some people's nutrition has not necessarily been the best option. And again, we <laughs> have seen them more than some of their healthcare providers. So, you know, in dentistry, I know in Ontario, particularly, I can speak to that, you know, we do have the opportunity to do some sort of nutritional counseling. But do you have any tips to help us get started with that? Because we learned it back in school, and most of us left it in school and never really brought it into practice. So what tips do you have to help us get started to start that conversation? So I think it's important to say that it is, at least from my experience with high, with teams, not just hygienists, but also doctors, like how do I talk to my obese and overweight patients about nutrition? I mean, I, I don't want to shame them. Well, we don't, we don't have a problem telling them that they have an abscess tooth and that what they need is a root canal or an extraction and an implant. The same thing that we should be very comfortable talking periodontal disease. So I'm going to get you excited because we talk in the caries risk assessment. If you want a place to talk nutrition, the caries risk assessment is a great place to start talking nutrition because there's the section where you need to know diet. And it's very simplified in many of them, but you can dive in deeper, especially if you know perio is a risk, caries is a risk physiologic. And then of course, systemic health is a risk as well, given metabolic conditions, especially if they have diabetes or cardiovascular disease. But one of the things that I think it's important, and I'm excited to say is that there are studies out there showing that by encouraging healthy diets, that it actually improves our patient's periodontal health. There was one study that was really, um, it was a one month, it was a month long study and it was a very simple study, but they, what they did in this study is they took two groups, uh, one group, there was no change other than they could not clean interproximal surfaces. Neither group clean, could clean interproximal surfaces. That would never work with a group of dental hygienists, but I appreciate the study. 
the second group, not only could they not clean um, uh, interproximal surfaces, but they were also on a very strict whole foods diet. Mm -hmm. So a diet rich in omega-3s, um, uh, minimal processed food. Um, uh, they ate uh, whole, like uh, seafood, so salmon. Um, they could eat as much fruit and vegetables as they want. Um, there's all these diets out there. Get, read Metabolical. It's a great book. Dr. Rub, Dr. Robert Lustig is a great source on nutrition, and he absolutely appreciates oral health and knows the role that we play as well. Um, but in this study that they found after a month, so they looked at um, inflammation prior to and there after the study. So do you... The group that only, they did not change their diet. They only did not clean interproximal surfaces. They obviously had what we would expect to see. They had inflammation. Mm -hmm. However, the group that ate healthy did not clean interproximal surfaces. Their bleeding improved. And not just a little bit. Don't tell my children that, please. Okay, don't tell my children that, okay? So here's what I say when I speak about this study. Don't ever tell your patients that. Skip the part about interproximal surfaces and just say there have been, there's been significant research and we know by eating a healthy, a whole foods rich diet, I'm not going to tell you to eat keto or vegetarian. I'm going to tell you to eat real food. This is not complicated. I'm going to tell you to eat real food. On the flip side of that, patients, which, you know, around 65% of our children in my country eat, or the children in my country, 65, I think it's 63 to 65% of their diet is ultra processed food. Adults, 57% of their diet is ultra processed food. So by eating those uh, ultra processed food rich diet, it absolutely depletes our body of uh, essential vitamins and minerals and minerals and vitamins that our oral microbiome needs. And so in return, it is going to result in higher risk factors because it depletes salivary, um, you know, not all pH. Um, um, so if we're eating good, it's going to improve the quality of our saliva. If we're eating, uh, unhealthy, it's going to, um, go the opposite way. Um, think about our patients. So our patients that are obese, you know, that they need to get healthy. Um, our patients with diabetes, um, I have several patients that, I work with that we talk about one healthy meal a day. And so baby step, let's not make this complicated. Let's just eat one whole foods rich. I want most of that plate to have vegetables and fruits and absolutely refer and work with nutritionists uh, and integrative physicians. Uh, this is part of that collaboration piece, but we do need to be talking to our patients about nutrition uh, because it does affect their oral health. So no, mm -hmm. it's not comfortable, but you're going to start seeing, I have too many patients that I've seen their A1C come down. I had a patient, he was like, my A1C has been nine to 12 for nearly two decades. You know, it's, so we're in, uh, you know, a year and a half later, it's not where we want it, but he's at a 7.8. He was used to a nine to 12 most of his life. He walks after one meal a day and he eats one healthy meal a day and he is determined to continue to get healthy. I have another patient that had a 6.3 and so pre-diabetes, this man's lost 60 pounds since I started seeing him. And, and of course, I always refer to physicians and nurse, I mean, nutritionists, dietitians, but we do get to talk nutrition with them. And when we believe in our patients, people need to be believed in. And when you have someone who sits in your chair and they have given up on life because they are 100 pounds overweight, 50 pounds overweight, they've lost their job because of everything going on the last two years. They need you to look them in the face 
and tell them that you care about them and that you want them to be healthier. And that by not only eating healthier and taking better care of their oral microbiome, it's also going to improve not only their gut health, they're gonna lose weight, but those, of, those that are struggling with depression, it very well could improve their depression as well. So I just wanna to touch on briefly, cause I know microbiome and bact oral bacteria have been found um, and are linked definitely with high, like we wanna have high fiber diets, not low fiber yes. diets. Can you quickly just sort of touch a bit on that? And particularly we know that PG and FN are, you know, really found and quite a problem in the gut. Yes, they are. And even Dr. Mia Geisinger, who is a future AAP, uh, president and um, a brilliant and kind woman. She and I have had many conversations about this. And uh, you, when you have a patient that you know is in gut dysbiosis, so they tell you that they have um, IBS, um, you know, they have gut issues, um, GERD, which GERD, by the way, think airway when you think GERD as well. And that might be the first time your patient ever has even heard of that, but that's a red flag as well. But back to the gut. Yes, PG is actually a, a, a big bad daddy in the cause of gut dysbiosis. Mm -hmm. Um, FN, Carrie, I, I kind of get nervous talking pathogens with Carrie because she's like the Carrie, I mean, she's, she's salivary diagnostic queen in my book, and she taught me so much about what I know about uh, salivary diagnostics, but FN can be found in, in um, gut, the colon as well, and, um, and in these guts, I mean, they're, it's resistant to the stomach, the stomach acid. And so, and we just wouldn't think that, that the oral microbiome bacteria could thrive in that, but a couple of them can. Michelle, you've talked a bit about the, um, like some of the specialists that you refer to just through what comes up in your assessments. And I like that you kind of talked about how that's opened up um, the door for other conversations and to get other professionals excited and on board with what we do. Um, just talking specifically about collaboration, can you go through some of maybe some other specialists or health professionals you haven't mentioned yet that you do refer to? Uh, cardiologists. I I'm, I'm really loving that I'm getting more and more cardiologists and oncologists uh, having their patients come and see us and, and vice versa. Uh, look at your patient's health history um, or if you have patient skin conditions. I've had many patients that have um, eczema, psoriasis, and uh, psoriasis, by the way, is uh, there's an association between psoriasis and periodontal disease as well. But so like referring to GI docs and nutritionists to do a better assessment of what's going on in the gut, MRT testing, sensitivity testing, uh, there's a lot of referral there. Cardiologists, and we know just because of the bi-directional relationship, I mean, that the association, the links, and, and even Brad Bell and Amy, Dr. Brad Bell and Dr. Amy Donine are saying that periodontal disease and abscess are one of the causes of heart attack and stroke. So uh, I think that's very important to, I mean, you can collaborate with any profession. I have patients that have RA that, um, that we make sure if they're not seeing a rheumatologist, we always, you know, there's one, um, one of my coworkers has RA and she absolutely loves the rheumatologist that she's going to, and they appreciate that we we understand the, the relationship between RA and periodontal disease. So almost any specialty in medicine, uh, there is room for collaboration. I mean, really all of them should be referring every single one of their patients. If I have a patient who comes in and says, hey, I'm going to this progressive doctor. And I was like, well, have they talked about your oral health yet? And if they say no, and I was like, well, they're missing a big, uh, they're missing a big piece. And I give them my card and I'm like, have your doctor call me or uh, I'd like to talk to him and I'd love for him to speak with Dr. Jeff Buski as well. Um, I really like working with Paul Thompson. Mm -hmm. Dr. Paul Thompson is, uh, he was 
he was a surgeon for many years, owned, owns a hospital. And he, when he was doing surgery, he was like, he kind of made fun of, of integrative doctors, not on purpose, but he was like, I don't even know that they all know what they're doing. Like they're not looking at all the pieces. Like there's so many puzzle pieces to put together when you're practicing integrative medicine. And, and then he got tired of practicing, you know, by the time he would get patients, it would be when it, they were so far gone. And so that quality care, uh, I mean, he did a great job on surgery. He was successful in surgery, but he decided, okay, I'm going to do the one thing that I've kind of laughed at my entire life. And I'm going to go in to integrative medicine and I'm going to start improving the quality of life. And so because of his, his past, um, experiences and and he's so well respected throughout healthcare. We will often, if it's a specialty that we don't know, I will reach out to him and say, "Hey, I've got a patient that has this going on. Who would you refer to?" And he always has a name to give me. I know back. I want to think the. I, I'm thinking of the article and I can see it in my slides, but it's from like 2009, and it says, you know, if you have a patient that has active periodontal disease, it's our responsibility to refer them to their family doctor and let the doctor know. And so we're often waiting, like we're saying, well, how come the cardiologist didn't tell you this? And how come, you know, you, your, your doctors aren't, and if we don't start that movement of that communication, mm -hmm. it's not going to be reciprocated. And so, you know, I'm finding more and more, the more I'm acknowledging it. And when you yeah. have those healthcare providers in your chair, it is our opportunity to educate them and say, you know, you know, nurses, well, when you have patients that have out of control diabetes and you're talking to them, ask them, have they been to the dentist lately? Bring in that oral health component because we can really help them. Like this is how we can really start the collaboration piece. And I found that to be incredibly helpful in educating some of my healthcare providers and my patients to kind of bring it all together. But, you know, Michelle, you've gone through so much today and I really appreciate you breaking it all down for us with regards to health history, with assessment, collaboration, nutrition. These are all things like it's 2022 guys and we have gotten an opportunity to really make a difference in our patients' lives. We save lives. We are not tooth cleaners. Okay, we should have a hashtag, not a tooth cleaner or not a tooth cleaner, you know, <laughs> yeah. to start a, a movement that way. But the truth of it is we can do so much. And you've given us some definite little puzzle pieces to try to put those puzzle pieces together. Um, if people want to reach out to you or follow you, I know you've got a really busy fall. I'm uh, not fall. We're not in fall. Wrong, wrong season. We're busy winter. <laughs> um, where can they follow you or watch you? Uh, I am on uh, Facebook and Instagram and it's Michelle, as you can see, M-A-C-H-E-L-L. -L, and you just put that there. I tell my mom, I was like, you just made me like the easiest person in the world to stalk. She does not think that's funny. Um, but I don't know that there's another Michelle with the same spelling. Um, so reach out to me there. Um, I'm very involved in the um, American Academy for Oral Systemic Health. And I encourage you, if you've enjoyed this, get comfortable, get, you know, fall in love with that organization, because they really do bring medicine and dentistry together and do what we should all be doing all along, what we should have been all been doing all along. And that is practicing true health care. And that's Indeed. working together. And the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health has something called red flags coming, not red, yes, no, is it red flags? It's in October. I mean, it's hot topics, hot topics, again, red flags and wrong months. So we're going to try this again, hot topics, <laughs> and it's going to be in February, um, but and it it's is, free. It is free. Exactly. So it's a really great intro, a really great way to kind of get going and to get started with that. So I would like to thank you on behalf of all of us for joining thank us you. today. Again, we really, really appreciate it. Kath, I know we've got a really busy January. I got the month right. Thank you very much. Um, what do we have going <laughs> on right now at RDHU? You know, I'm just thinking that maybe we can send a follow up email with some of these links so they can have direct links. I'm also thinking of your course your red flags course, uh, Carrie, with, you know, so we can learn more about the A1C and, and, and the importance of, of doing all these um, um, assessments. So perhaps we can put together a really nice follow up email and send it to everybody. Um, well, for us in Ontario, we have portfolio season. 
So um, yeah, so this is a really busy time where uh, we have dental hygienists who are submitting their portfolios. We're getting audited. So um, yeah, Beth and I and our coaches, we're all super busy doing that this month, but we do have some programs coming up. Um, I'm just looking here, looking at Dr. Johal's, uh, she has care beyond the chair, the collaborative approach, that'd be a great um, extra layering of, of learning to go along with today, and that's in March. Uh, we have connecting the dots between tongue ties, myofunctional therapy, and orthodontics, and that is actually happening this month, I think, um, January 18th, again with Dr. Johal, so she would be a great uh, resource to continue learning about this, this topic. Um, and then our lovely Anna Louise, we have, what do we have with you, Anna Louise? We have um, Essentials for Documentation happening this month, and that is starting January 24th. So everything is online. We have um, courses that are, you know, spread throughout three nights, or it could be over two days on a weekend. Um, so yeah, there's lots of different things coming up. We've got the process of care, the dental hygiene process of care, which Again, you guys talk about assessments and all that in your process of care. So that's another great resource. And that one is coming up with Beth and Carrie on starting on uh, Saturday, January 22nd, and then it finishes on Saturday, January 29th. So yeah, so there's lots of um, extra resources for this um, type of topic, right? So we can dig deep and really make a difference with uh, with what it is we do, because everybody's posting here, we save lives, which we certainly do. So let's keep let's keep on going and let's make 2022 the best year yet. And I want to add one other resource. I know right now we haven't fully released all of the RDHQ series of the recorded webinars, but some of those definitely can tie into this oral okay. systemic component and can be a really great resource. So uh, we've got some really great stuff coming forward. Michelle, thank you for starting this off. Thank what is her you. Quote? Beth, Beth thank what's her you. quote? What's her oh. quote? Just loving the heck out of my patients. There you go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> y'all are funny. We hope this that you so much all... fun. Thank y'all. Thank yes. everyone. That Thank you. And Sonia, with us. the process of care is on the weekend, Sonia. She's just asking. Yeah. So I'll send a follow up email and we'll add some links. Okay. So you can just click on that and register with Beth and, and Carrie. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Happy New Bye. Year. Happy New Year. Have a happy day. Bye. Happy New Year. Bye, Bye y'all.